It can't be overstated just how big of a deal it was when Hulk Hogan jumped ship to WCW. Hogan had created more than a legacy in the WWF, he was arguably bigger than the company itself, and the thought of Hulk Hogan working for the WWF's main competitor of the 90s sounded totally insane. Hogan had it good in the World Wrestling Federation, his contract was steady and his merchandise flew off the shelves, but by 1993, Hogan also felt he could do more outside of wrestling. The WWF itself was moving in a different direction, leading to younger and more athletic superstars being put at the forefront, and Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon had contrasting ideas when it came to moving forward with the Hulk Hogan brand. Along with this, Hulk Hogan had been offered a TV acting role in the Thunder in Paradise show. Thunder in Paradise was produced by the same team who worked on Baywatch, and Hulk Hogan felt that this new role could be his big break into acting, a more lucrative and safe journey than that of a WWF superstar. WWF TV producer Bruce Pritchard said, In our opinion, he was counting his chickens before they hatched, but that's where his head was. His head was in Hollywood, he was thinking he could become a big syndicated TV star and he wouldn't have to wrestle anymore. Vince McMahon said, Hogan stated that he would never compete against me. He wanted out of his contract, so I said okay. I think part of that was certainly on me and my view of his career as well. I felt like he had reached his zenith. Hogan's final WWF date of 1993 has been the subject of debate, but all signs point to Hogan wrapping things up in August of 93 after a European tour. This would have been around two months after his last WWF televised match against Yokozuna at the 93 King of the Ring. In September of 1993, Hogan returned to New Japan Pro Wrestling for two matches, the first being a tag match where Hogan partnered up with the Great Muda to take on Road Warrior Hawk and the Power Warrior, and he also defeated Muda in his second match during this stint. This Muda vs Hogan match was a rematch from their May 1993 WWF Champion vs IWGP Champion encounter, and at the very beginning of 1994, just as a quick side note, Hogan also defeated Tatsumi Fujinami in the Tokyo Dome. So Thunder in Paradise then. The show was originally filmed at St. Pete Beach in Florida, but eventually, production moved over to Disney World in Orlando. Disney's Hollywood Studios was used as a main location, while scenes were filmed around the Disney World Resort. As fate would have it, Eric Bischoff and WCW were also filming their weekly TV tapings at Disney's Hollywood Studios, at the very next soundstage as a matter of fact. Ric Flair has been credited as the man who set up the meetings between Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. Hulk Hogan said, on the soundstage next to us was Ted Turner's WCW. The next thing I know, this guy named Eric Bischoff started coming over to me and he began bringing Ric Flair with him. He kept telling me, hey Hulk, we want you to come back and be a part of wrestling again. I said no way, but this went on for a good 5 or 6 months. I missed wrestling so much that finally I caved and I went to work for Ted Turner. Of course, money also played a big part in the signing of Hulk Hogan to WCW. I've went over the lucrative deal Hogan signed in the past, but in short, Hulk Hogan's contract was one of the best contracts not only in wrestling, but in all of sports and entertainment. Hogan had a great downside, but his bonuses and incentives were just flat out crazy. If people tuned into WCW and people bought the pay-per-views, Hogan stood to make an incredible amount of money. I'm sure Hogan missed wrestling, but he gave up the acting dream at the drop of a hat once he got that lucrative offer from Ted Turner and Eric Bischoff. To mark the occasion, WCW had a Hulk Hogan parade in Disney's Hollywood Studios. So there's a little backstory, so let's get into the nitty gritty and look at Hogan's WCW matches. Initially, Jimmy Hart was by Hogan's side during his early WCW days too, so Hogan must have worked out a pretty sweet deal for the mouth of the South also. Eventually, the Booty Man, or Brother Brudai, or Brutus Beefcake, whatever, he would also join Hulk Hogan's side. 
Hogan showed up then at Clash of the Champions 27 in grand style, arriving in a white limousine with a police escort. What you have to keep in mind though is that Clash 27 was held in South Carolina and fans would know that the Carolinas were pretty much flair country. Hulk Hogan then, the big WWF star, was going into enemy territory here in his very first appearance and you can definitely hear some boos when he and Jimmy Hart step out of the limousine. Now to be fair, there were also a lot of cheers for Hogan too, but it wasn't the huge ovation that Hulk was accustomed to. If you want an idea of how much WCW were willing to push Hulk Hogan early on, he was featured in no less than four segments during this entire broadcast, with his final segment featuring a challenge for Ric Flair's World Heavyweight Championship. Flair had just defeated Sting on this very same night, so yeah, Hulk Hogan's very first match in WCW would be for the World Heavyweight Championship, and of course, Hulk Hogan also won the match. Hogan didn't need a long build up, he didn't need a program to ease him into the title picture, no, straight in and take the title, just like that. Again, to be fair though, the crowd's reaction to Hogan winning the title here was thunderous at Bash at the Beach 1994, though it was held in Florida and not Flair Country. Hogan's next appearance for WCW happened just a month later at Clash of the Champions 28, and boy oh boy, first of all, WCW promoted the Hulk Hogan Hotline, a premium phone number where you could take part in Hulk Hogan trivia and get a special message from Hulk Hogan himself. Right after this, Mean Gene Okerlund was scheduled to interview Hulk, but the Hulkster was attacked by a man wearing a mask. Keep in mind, Hogan also had a championship defence later in the night against Ric Flair. The next 10 to 15 minutes of the broadcast was just Hogan receiving medical attention, and then after the next match, Hogan was shown getting brought into a hospital as Eric Bischoff said the attacker had snapped something in Hogan's leg or knee. Throughout the show, we were given updates on Hulk Hogan's condition multiple times, and Ric Flair came out to tell Hogan he had to forfeit the championship. When it was time for the Flair vs Hogan match, Hogan had made a miraculous recovery and the match went on as planned. Hogan lost via countout when Sherry attacked him with her shoe, and then the masked man came to the ring to help Flair beat up Hogan. Sting came to the rescue, and we went off the air. Following this show, WCW booked the 1994 Hulkamania tour in Europe, where Hogan defeated Ric Flair in every match they were booked in. The next big pay per view was Halloween Havoc 1994, and again we had Flair vs Hogan in the main event. This steel cage match though was also a retirement match, and we all know how retirement matches go in wrestling, but still, here we are. Mr. T also served as the special referee for this match. Anyway, this match got pretty chaotic, with Sting making an appearance, Sherry getting involved inside the cage, the masked man making another appearance. It was a bit messy for sure, and not a match that I can recommend. Hogan gets the pinfall win, and after the match, the masked man once again tried to attack Hogan. Hogan got the upper hand and removed the mask, and lo and behold, it was Brother Brudai all along, Hogan's coattail rider himself. Avalanche and Kevin Sullivan came to help Brother Brudai attack Hogan, leading to Sting again coming out to see of the Hulkster as the show went off the air. So Kevin Sullivan, Avalanche and Brother Brudai, who would soon become known as The Butcher, formed the Three Faces of Fear. The team were defeated at Clash of the Champions 29 by Hulk, Sting and Dave Sullivan, and at Starcade 1994, Hogan defeated The Butcher in the main event of WCW's biggest yearly show. You can see here then that since Hogan made his way to WCW in mid-94, the company done nothing but push him to the moon. People say that the NWO's arrival in 1996 changed the landscape of WCW, and it definitely did, but Hogan done the same thing here in 1994 when he debuted. He was the centre of attention on every WCW show that he appeared in. Anyway, also at start, Arcade, Big Van Vader bumped into Hulk Hogan backstage, telling him he was coming for the Hulkster's WCW Championship. Macho Man Randy Savage made his way to WCW in December of 1994, and he would quickly align himself with Hulk Hogan, having saved the Hulkster from the three faces of fear towards the end of Starcade. 
Savage and Hogan defeated Kevin Sullivan and The Butcher at Clash of the Champions 30 and after the match, Big Van Vader showed up to powerbomb the Hulkster and Hogan no sold the move. Vader's finisher, a move that had devastated opponents around the world and Hogan no sold it. This would set up the main event at the next big show, Super Brawl 5, a world title match pitting Hulk Hogan against Vader. Hogan won via disqualification at around the 15 minute mark, but Vader returned the favour to Hogan when he no sold the leg drop and kicked out at 1. This started a match series between Vader and Hogan that lasted for months, with rematches happening at Uncensored 1995 and Bash at the Beach 95, however Hogan defeated Vader in every match they had together. The uncensored match between Hogan and Vader was atrocious. This was booked as a classic strap match where the winner had to touch all four corner turnbuckles to get the victory. During the match, Ric Flair interfered, the same Ric Flair who Hogan had retired months earlier. Hogan ended up getting the strap on Flair and he dragged him to all four corners while touching the turnbuckles. Somehow, this counted as a victory for the Hulkster, so Vader didn't even technically lose this match. This main event also saw the debut of the Renegade character in WCW. You can learn more about that in my previous Renegade video. Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan defeated the reinstated Ric Flair and Vader at Slamboree in 1995, and after this, the Vader vs Hogan feud had ended with Hulk clearly getting the upper hand at every meeting they had. I feel this was a mistake. If there was a heel on the WCW roster who could take down Hulkamania, at least for a little while and his name wasn't Ric Flair, then it was definitely Vader. However, WCW were all too happy to continue pushing Hogan with no one seemingly being able to touch him. In saying this, with the exception of the strap match, I feel the Hogan vs Vader matches are still worth watching, just because it really did feel like Vader could have defeated the Hulkster at certain points of the feud. Anyway, moving on, the three faces of fear were revamped into the Dungeon of Doom, a stable seemingly made just to feud with Hulk Hogan and bring an end to Hulkamania. At Fall Brawl 1995, the Dungeon of Doom were defeated by the team of Hulk Hogan, Lex Luger, Sting and Randy Savage in a War Games match, one of the least memorable War Games matches in WCW history. I should also mention that in the same month that Fall Brawl 1995 occurred, WCW officially launched Nitro, their new Monday Night TV show. Hogan appeared on the first two episodes with victories over Big Bubba Rogers and Lex Luger. So Halloween Havoc 1995 was next and yeah, this is what many remember from this era of Hulk Hogan. The Giant had made his WCW debut as the kayfabe son of Andre the Giant, a moniker that was quickly dropped but anyway, the Giant would be getting his hands on Hulk Hogan at the Halloween Havoc pay per view. Before their match, in a pre-taped segment that would air on the Halloween Havoc show, the Giant and Hulk Hogan faced off in a monster truck match, basically a sumo match held on the arena roof involving monster trucks. Mr Eric Bischoff himself must have thought that wrestling fans would automatically love monster trucks but anyway, after Hogan won the match, the Giant came after Hogan which led to the Giant falling off the side of the building. Now, this type of fall would probably mean the Giant would be no more, I mean who could survive such a huge drop from an arena building, but nope, the Giant just walked on out for his match with Hogan later in the evening and he won the WCW Championship. If Hogan got disqualified during this match, he would lose the WCW Championship and this is exactly what would happen after Jimmy Hart hit Hogan with the championship belt and joined forces with the Dungeon of Doom. After the match, the Yeti came to the ring and helped the Giant put Hogan in a double bear hug, resulting in one of the most awkward looking spots in the history of professional wrestling. In the end, due to Jimmy Hart's interference, the title ended up getting vacated and put up for grabs in the very first World War 3 match, and Randy Savage won the match and the championship. Hogan was involved in the World War 3 match and he didn't get officially eliminated, still the referees assumed Hogan was thrown over the top rope when they saw him on the outside and Savage was given the win. Just before the World War 3 match, Hogan had a match with Sting on the November 20th 1995 edition of Nitro, a forgotten match here in the Sting vs Hogan saga. The match went to a no contest. 
Super Brawl 6 saw Hulk get a little revenge on the giant when he defeated him in a steel cage match, and after this, Hogan made his way to Uncensored 96 to take part in one of the most infamous matches of this WCW era, the Doomsday Cage Match. Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage took on Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Meng, the Barbarian, Lex Luger, the Taskmaster, Zeus, working here as Zed Gangsta, and the ultimate solution. And with these odds placed against them, Savage and Hogan still won the match. An 8 on 2 handicap match, and Hogan and Savage won. Unreal. The 8 man team were dubbed the Alliance to end Hulkamania, and they still couldn't get the job done. Now, the triple deck Doomsday Cage was a great visual for sure, but the whole thing was a mess. Hogan and Savage would have to fight their way from the top section through to the two middle sections and then they would have to wrestle their opponents on the ring that was on the bottom section. Pretty much a gauntlet match where Hogan and Savage would work their way down the cage, needing to score pinfalls or submissions in order to move on to the next tier. But it was brutal, especially on the upper decks of the cage where the wrestlers fought each other very gingerly. And the match got particularly bad in the last tier when Hogan and Savage battled Solution and Gangsta. It's one of those things though that still needs to be seen. As bad as it is, it's become a talking point over the years when discussing bad WCW matches. I really wish there was something good I could say about this match, and I guess the concept in the cage itself looked pretty good, but in execution, this was one of WCW's worst ever main events, in my opinion. Hogan would then have two matches on two separate episodes of Nitro in April of 96. The first saw him team up with the reborn brother Brudai, working now as the Booty Man, in a winning effort against Arn Anderson and Kevin Sullivan. On the 15th of April, Hogan defeated Arn Anderson and Kevin Sullivan in a handicap match, so who needs the Booty Man anyway? Hogan would not make any further in-ring appearances for WCW until the summer of 1996, when he showed up at Bash at the Beach and made history alongside WCW newcomers Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. So, from the Doomsday Cage match to the forming of the NWO mere months later, you can definitely tell here that Hulk Hogan knew he had to make a change. It's interesting though to look back at Hulk Hogan before the NWO and how he won match after match, and even after turning heel, this is a trend that would continue. Yes, there were a few bumps along the way, but by and large, Hulk Hogan was unstoppable in WCW when it came to his win-loss record. Anyway, you can continue on with Hulk Hogan's WCW career by checking out my Hulk Hogan NWO Year 1 video, a video that directly follows what happens next in Hogan's career. Looking back here, the thing that stands out the most really is how hard Hogan was being pushed. WCW really did bad high on Hulk Hogan becoming a success in WCW, and over and over again, they would book him into winning situations. If Hogan ever lost a match, it was due to outside interference or something that was totally out of Hogan's control, and I just feel this didn't help him get over at all with the traditional WCW audience. WCW diehards knew what was happening, they were watching this big WWF guy come in, take the title in his first match and completely steamroll the opposition, and many fans didn't like it. In the summer of 1996 then, turning Hulk Hogan heel would be the absolute best thing to do for so many reasons. The Hulkamania stuff was becoming stale, the true traditional fans of WCW didn't want to cheer him, and the landscape of professional wrestling was quickly shifting into a more contemporary product. If Hogan went another two years in WCW with the yellow and red, being the white meat babyface and all that, then it's hard to imagine him surviving in the company. Thankfully though, Hogan put on the black and white, and soon enough, the New World Order were positioned to change the entire wrestling world.